Blade Liners. I'm your host, Vicki Duvall. Now listen, you may know a thing or two about our guest today. Bernard Tomic is a Wimbledon quarterfinalist. He reached his career high singles ranking of number 17 in the world in 2011 and has four ATP singles titles. I find it kind of interesting that we've never really interacted, even though we've crossed paths a ton on tour. So I'm really excited to catch up with you, Bernard, and thank you so much for doing this episode today. Yeah, no problem. Pleasure. <laughs> so you're currently in Gold Coast, Australia, which is an absolute gorgeous place to be. I think I went once like three years ago, um, and I feel like Australia is handling the pandemic better than anywhere. Well, anywhere is better than the U.S., but yeah. what's life like on the Gold Coast? Are there a lot of restrictions? Well, uh, not so really. I think we are the probably best city in the world that was less affected by this corona and I think many people around the world were all fascinated how Gold Coast was one of I think three cities that weren't sort of struck or Queensland if I should say our state so we've been quite good I think we got over corona about maybe three four five months ago we had a little bit of restrictions in, in April May June but apart from that our cases have been good early throughout the year so um we've been uh, we've been miraculously like a really good okay so um we're, we're, we're really we're really lucky um melbourne's been shocking so it's kind of interesting to hear you say it's like kind of normal like i couldn't imagine just having like a normal life here in the u.s because as you know it's just like beyond ridiculous over here but um so what have you been kind of been doing to pass the time much doing nothing i came back i used my <laughs> little chance and window just to have a break and for me it was quite good um you know i think not seeing an airplane for like eight months was was really good um so the corona time came perfect for me <laughs> um because i was a little bit over traveling let's say last couple of years so for me this this year has been quite actually good and uh, i use my time here at home to have a break to to really feel like i'm normal again and get my energy back for for, for when the tour starts again yeah, that's a really good way to look at it. I think for a lot of people, that's kind of been one side or the other. Either you see the bright side in the situation or it's kind of been like one of the worst years ever. So I think that's really awesome that you get to see the bright side of it. So before we get into any tennis, I found this really interesting when I was doing my research. You were a cast member on season four of Australia's I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here, which is, yeah. I guess, similar to Survivor for the American show. And yeah. I was like, oh, my God, I saw some of your clips when you were, um, like, I saw yeah. one quick interview. But what was your experience like on the show? That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, <laughs> I was not playing tennis at that period. So they asked me if I, if I wanted to go on the show. So I sort of said I would. And I went there and it was a, you know, unbelievable experience. I got to go to Africa. I got to see and do many things I've never done before. Um, I didn't last long on the show. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I jumped out of an airplane. I got bit, um, bitten by a snake five times in a, in a quiz or a trial we had to do. I, yeah, it was. Uh, I'd slept, we slept outside in the in the in, in the jungle for like four. Uh, I survived four nights. So it was for me like a new experience, um, something I've never done before. It was almost like camping back in the day, and uh, I enjoyed it. It was really fun. It's just a shame I ended it early because I wasn't. I was panicking. I wasn't used to the environment. So um, um, when I think about it, when I think back to it, I, I, I would do it again for sure. Oh, my gosh. So if anyone's listening from the show, the next season you're on. <laughs> Probably. Maybe, maybe, maybe after I'm re retired or something. <laughs> and you're going to last longer than four episodes this time. <laughs> uh, probably. More than four days. <laughs> So let's get the ball rolling nice and easy here. Who was your tennis idol growing up? I mean, I idolized the Federer at a young age, Federer and Agassi, but um, just sort of stopped idolizing anyone after a period of time, but definitely Roger, I'd say. And then after I had the photo with him at the age of 13, he really wasn't my idol anymore. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I don't know the story. I think you're going to have to elaborate a little for us. <laughs> no, I met him down at, for the first time, I think, at Crown when I was 13. Got the photo with him and he went from being my idol to not my idol. <laughs> you know so that's I mean? the end of that. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, basically that. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a lot of success as a junior, winning both Aussie Open and U.S. Open Junior Slams. Your success continued into the pros, and in 2011, at the age of 18 years old, you became the youngest player since Boris Becker to reach the quarterfinals at Wimbledon. I can imagine that's a lot to take in. Obviously, you know, it was a very smooth transition into the pros, but was it overwhelming for you to jump into, you know, celebrity status so quickly and pretty much millions of dollars at such a young age? Yeah, it was, it was. I mean, uh, I was playing very, very, very good tennis at the age of 10, 12, 14. Um, I think, you know, winning, I think, three Orange Bowls. So I was very, very successful at a young age. So I always had winning with me through, throughout the start of my career. And then, obviously, playing well at Wimbledon, playing in the quarterfinals uh, at, at 18 made my sort of mark there and uh, got to the top, say, 60, 50 of the world. And I think I finished that year at top 40. So I was, you know, always doing well at a young age. I remember winning mac- uh, matches at the Australian Open at 16. I think I was the youngest uh, also there, but it's just, you know, it's just that presence. I was really, really good at a young age because I think the juniors transitioned me into the seniors to be playing well at such a young age. Um, you know, when I think about it, it was also a long time ago. I'm 28 now. It was, you know, a decade ago, almost 12, 13 years ago. So um, I enjoyed it. Time went like this. So you also got to respect that. Yeah. <laughs> was it difficult, I guess, Coming from a junior, having so much success, and even like you oh. said, transitioning into your pros. Yeah, yeah. When you start, I guess, n- not winning as many matches as you did before, is that something kind of hard to process, or what's that like? Well, absolutely, I think for sure. I mean, I was just used to winning so much ma- uh, matches at a at a young age. So at the age of you know eighteen, I think to about twenty five, twenty six, I was winning a lot of matches even on tour. Um, and then yeah, so once you've sort of been in that moment for a while and experienced it at a high level and stuff it became a little bit difficult for me to travel a little bit my mental game sort of started playing up which wasn't the the best thing in the career in in your sport especially in a one-on-one sport like tennis if you're mentally not there one-on-one you're you're gonna lose it's not like basketball or soccer where you can have guys playing for you competing and you know you can still win the match in tennis it looks different you play bad you feel bad you're mentally bad you're gonna lose so the transition was a little bit tricky for me, but it was pretty easy for me. But um, I, I enjoyed the I enjoyed playing and playing in the juniors, stress free. It became a little bit more stressful at a at a at a older age on tour. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. When you're younger and there's just like no expectation whatsoever, you're like, oh yeah, this person, I'm gonna beat them. Who cares? <laughs> exactly. It was all yeah. about winning, and now there's yeah. fans watching you. There's 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 media. Yeah. There's there's a whole lot of other crap in the background that you know drives a man insane. <laughs> so speaking of fans and media, I found it pretty interesting that as a public figure, you're not on any social media platforms. I probably know the answer to that, but why is that? Oh yeah, I've, I've really never started that. You know, I never really got into social media. I think Instagram back when everyone sort of got into it. So I think it was my mistake. But I never really enjoyed enjoyed it you know i mean i've got a fake instagram account i stalk people (laughs) basketball players uh, you know but uh, for my personal use no i've never really done that Uh, maybe in something in the future i would maybe look at doing but for now okay i think that's pretty commendable i'm like i probably am on social media too much but i think it's just it's one of those things now you're just like so wrapped up into it like for me i'm just like i can't get out of it (laughs) but i'm like it is better for mental health if i'm not on it so hopefully i can follow in your steps (laughs) exactly uh, (laughs) i'm an extreme i'm an extremist i'm either full on instagram or completely not so it's either one left (laughs) or right there's no in between with me (laughs) i love that So kind of going along the line of media, I have to ask you this. You're often referred to as the bad boy of tennis based on what people see in the news. And they're not wrong sometimes. I'm sorry. (laughs) But what is the Bernard outside of the tennis court and behind closed doors like? Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, the media portrayed me a little bit of a naughty boy. (laughs) Um, 
but it's the you know I've done some things that I regret. That's for sure not uh, something good to do. So um, maybe that's what betrayed my image uh, in that way. But I believe in, uh, in in normal normal eyes and around normal people, I'm I'm a pretty okay guy and pretty normal, and I uh, get along with many people. It's just I think just tennis brought the wrong side out of me and a little bit of stuff that I didn't want to do. So. Do I regret those things? Oh, for sure. Can I take them back? No, but you know, you learn and that's, that's the important thing. Yeah, that's good. That's all you can really do. <laughs> so there are five Aussies currently in the top hundred on the men's side. And from the outside, it seems like there's a pretty solid bond between the Aussie players. And I know, you know, you're in Australia and you're in that environment as well. How often do you train with those guys and what's your relationship like with them? Yeah, I mean, on tour with the Aussies, we're pretty much we're all fine, we're okay. I'm good mates with with, with Nick, with uh, Demon R, and many of the other Aussies, Milman and, and Tom. So we're all pretty much good friends. But uh, I mean, everyone's got their sort of own individual training base they use in Australia. I mean, Nick lives in Canberra. I'm up on the Gold Coast. Milman's in Brisbane. Good uh, access in Melbourne. So everyone's sort of split and split all over the Australia. Australia is quite quite a big country, so it's you know. <laughs> I'd like to say not as big as America, but <laughs> or USA. So we're, we're so we're so we're all pretty much distance distant apart in in Oz. But everyone does their own training. Everyone trains well. I'm pretty sure. And if we're around like we are at tournaments, so we'll always hit with each other. That's what we do. We we we, we, we I'm quite really good friends with all the Australian players. So if they, I think it's good if you have a good bond with your team. Uh, team country players, it's always important. Um, you don't want to be ignoring people. You don't want to be doing this and that. So I think it's really good. Uh, yeah, and I think I think the the kind of relationship you guys have really shines at Davis Cup as well. You guys have had a lot of success. And it's always really fun to watch. You know, you're a character on court. Nick's a character on court. Even Demon, I think that's what's kind of interesting about all the Aussie players. You guys are just yeah. really fun to watch. So that's yeah. awesome. Demon has a complete uh, machine. Yeah. <laughs> He's a machine, works hard, and uh, we're a little bit opposite of him. <laughs> <laughs> I always see he posts his um, videos on Instagram of, like, running up hills and stuff, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, the guy's yeah, a machine. Uh, yeah, he trains really hard, really well. That's why he, he's a very good player. Yeah. So pivoting quickly before we get back into some more tennis, you've talked about your love for cars and specifically sports cars. I don't know if you own any, but what's the fastest model car you've driven? The fastest? Um, or maybe your favorite too. We're going to throw Probably the R8 in Monaco. Um, I have a few cars now, Bentley, uh, Ferrari, but the Ferrari's in, in Europe. This one's here. Um, but I personally, I like, what do I like? <laughs> Especially the R8 I used to have, an Audi R8 back three, four, five years ago. In Monaco. That was my, probably my favourite. I also had a Lamborghini a few years ago in Australia. That was also quite cool. What's the fastest I've been? I've been on the track. Like, I was three. probably doing 300, 310 on the track in uh, Germany. Three, oh maybe even God. 320. So what's that? Probably like two... With 200 miles. Oh, you're, oh, that's kilometers. Okay, I was like, oh my God, yeah. that doesn't sound safe at all. <laughs> probably, probably 180, 200 miles an hour. Oh my gosh. Was it scary at all or you're just kind of used to it? <laughs> uh, so just an adre adrenal adrenaline rush. You feel like <laughs> jumping off a bungee jumping off a cliff or, or parachuting, you know? Have you done that too? I've jumped off a, off a plane, yeah. Oh, that was in, uh, in Africa? Yeah, I'm never going to do that again, though. <laughs> I always joke around, I'm going to wait till I'm like 70-something years old to jump off a plane so that if it does, something happens, I'm half dead anyway. <laughs> yeah, All right. you, you at least have to do it once in your life, at least once. <laughs> I'll wait till I'm super old. <laughs> so what other hobbies do you enjoy outside of tennis? Well, um, I enjoy playing uh, I enjoy playing video games and so I just hang around with my mates. Um, I used to play Warcraft. I used to play a lot of World of Warcraft computer game. It's not the most, it's not the best computer game to get addicted to, but sadly I did get addicted to it in a period. Uh, <laughs> I started playing a couple months ago again, which is not good. It takes up half my day. Um, <laughs> but basically, yeah, I do 
I just try to do normal things but these days, you know, as opposed to back then, you know, just to make me believe I'm normal, you know? <laughs> That's important. I don't play video games. Actually, I do. I have a Switch, but I only play, like, the OG games like Mario Kart, Mario... Pokemon. Yeah, Donkey Kong. Yeah, yeah I play that as well. <laughs> the PS5 just came out. Uh, just, uh, I just got the, the, the new one, PS5. It's pretty cool. You got it? Oh, my God. That's yeah, awesome. I was fortunate to get it before everyone else. <laughs> but it's cool. It's quite cool. I think... Uh, I think the graphics have proved at least 20%. It's a lot lot better. I don't even know, want to think and imagine what they've got installed. So only the next five, ten years. Like it's going to almost look like you're playing in real life in five years. You know? <laughs> I feel like technology in general is going to be a little bit scary in five years. So we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, 100%. It's already made. <laughs> <laughs> So getting back into tennis a little bit now, you have a game style that's pretty unpredictable and difficult to play against. I think your shot that stands out to me the most is your forehand job shot. I feel like every time I watch you play, you yeah. just like wind up like you're going to crack it. And then it's just like at the last second, you're like, psych, and you hit a job shot. Um, and they can never uh -huh. read it, which is hilarious. But yeah. Are there any players that you've played against that give you a similar sense of unpredictability and keep you on your toes like you usually do to your opponents? Yeah, there's a couple of guys I struggle playing with on tour. Um, guys like uh, Dan Evans. He's um, the very place similar to me, and I think he's a lot shorter than me and moves a lot better. Doesn't serve as good, but he's... I think I've been in one slot four times. Schwartzman and, and Simon, like, I've never beaten. I think I'm down 3 0, 4 0 on them. Um, pretty interesting because, you know, some guys got a good head to head, like uh, Anderson and uh, Query. I think I'm both on 4 0, 4 0 on them, and, 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 and Goffin. And there's many players that I've, you know, haven't lost to that are good. Yeah. But there's some guys I can't play, and they're always the tricky ones. Uh, so, I mean, like, Evans is one of them. Feliciano Lopez, tough always to play. Plays very similar in the lefty version of me. Um, and then again, there's always these awkward plays that you just can't beat. You know, sometimes I'd rather go ahead and and uh, you know, you'd rather play Chilich or, or, or the Rinka, <laughs> like I've won in the past against them. But yeah. but you'd rather not play a guy that you haven't played. You know. Same thing, like sometimes I get on court, like same, I'm, I've got a good head to head against uh, Vadasco. I'm 6 0 as well, or 6 1, I believe. And I lost once when I was 16 or 17. And uh, just, yeah, sometimes you play like Birdish, I'm 5 0 down. Like it's either, it's either with me, I'm like up on you by a lot, or I'm like down. <laughs> so it, it depends on the matchup, you know, and stuff. Some play quality, quality players, like I, I cannot lose to some players that are not as good as them. I just struggle because. It's just a different game, so it's always a, it's always a weapon because everyone plays differently. So if you bring your game on the court, like it's just these days, the many guys that are playing differently, uh, that, that, that and that's why they're there. You know, back back in the day, a lot of players used to grind and do this. Now there's a lot of guys that do some things that work for them, and it's quite quite difficult. You know, I find it kind of interesting that you kind of have, based on what you're saying, a little bit of a harder time playing people who play like you because. I would imagine with, like, how flat you hit the ball and stuff, you'd like the ball to sit right there. But the guys who actually spin, you have a better record against. Yeah, yeah. That's like kind of interesting. That, yeah, I've never really yeah, – like, yeah, there's always these, these guys. There's always going to be on tour, basically, guys that you cannot play. It doesn't matter who mm. you are. Whether you're top 10, 20, you've you – know, I remember Burdish and Anderson's head-to-head -head was 13-0, 12-0. Anderson's now, I think Ferrer's record on Djokovic is 13-0 or on Federer's 14-0 as well. The guy was five years in the top five in the world. So, you know, it's like sometimes you just can't play the particular person. Yeah. I feel that 100%. There's definitely a couple of girls. I'm not going to expose myself too hard here, but <laughs> there's a yeah, couple people. I'm play. like, I just, I don't you know what to play. do. <laughs> exactly. So you did a press conference at Wimbledon where you candidly said you lacked motivation to train and compete after one of your matches. And I think people really don't understand how common that feeling is for tennis players because the sport is very emotionally and physically demanding. So my question is, what are some of the things you do to get yourself feeling motivated again when you do get those feelings? 
Well, I mean, you always got to find, like tennis is very important, you always got to find something that makes you happy. I mean, for many years on tour, say the age of 17, 18 to about 25, before that Wimbledon comment, I was a little bit happier, a little bit happier. I'm not saying it was the most happiest because I was not. I was just much in a better state than I was the last two, three years when I did a lot of dumb stuff. So um, it's always important to, 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 to find what drives you because at the end of the day, if you're health, if you're healthy, one, and the most important, if you're happy too, it's going to make a person do good things. If you're not happy these days for anything, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna just go about it, and you're gonna do, do it miserably. You're gonna get tired. You're gonna get bored and stuff. And especially someone like me who's never really had a love for tennis, then it becomes a little bit tricky. But if you find ways to enjoy and be happy, if you can just be happy on a court or whatever you're doing, and you're gonna bring the best out of a person or, or a human. That's that's the way life works, you know. So to get yourself to feel kind of, I guess. I guess my input would be also to kind of have like less expectations. I think for me personally, that's what's helped me to be happier too. So I know for a lot of players, like the stress comes from thinking about ranking or thinking about like, you know, money or whatever it is. So I guess in your perfect world, what's your mindset like when you're at your best mentally? Are you just thinking about, you know, you're in the moment, you're not thinking about the rankings, uh, or are you kind of motivated by that stuff? Uh, happiness drives a man. It's, it's a motivation. It's a combination of things. But I think the most important, if you're actually happy with yourself in the moment, in, in, in the past day, past week, past month, that's what, that's what, that's what I believe makes anybody play really good tennis or, 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 or really good whatever they're doing you know you have to be happy it's that's that, that's that's what i figured out no, i've played my best tennis when i've been happy so there's no you can be fit you can be 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 uh, trained for three weeks and then if you're depressed and if you're not mentally there if you're worried about other things if you're like yeah it's not going to bring the best out of you. you'd rather be not ready and not prepared but be happy and you're gonna play good tennis that's the way it works if you're happy in life it strives a, a human being to do good things. Uh, I'm like with my notepad, like, yes, happiness. I need happiness. <laughs> no, happiness is, the, is, the, is, the, is probably the most important thing that people forget and stuff. And I see many people on tour, they're like depressed half the time, even like I know this for myself. You know, I was uh, depressed 80, 90%. Like I'm only sort of happy the last couple of months now. So I found a few things that drive me and stuff uh, uh, that, that makes a man feel you know, good, but you know, on tour, many people are very depressed, very sad, very this. And tennis is lonely. I get it. It's so lonely. You, you understand? It's like an isolated sport. You got your your one coach there, and your physio. They have to travel tournament, tournament, suitcase to suitcase, lose next tournament, it's another city, airplane, lose. It becomes a little bit mentally. It's not like you got team, a team of basketballers there. Let's go, let's go. You lose in the NBA, or you're flying you got a team of soccer players. It becomes different when you're isolated. So you need to find something that drives you to make you happy because you're not going to get friends. You're not going to get mates that will push you. You're not going to do the work with a lot of mates that will, uh, you know. So tennis becomes very, very challenging for many people, which people don't understand. People think it's all uh, this. It's not. Tennis is uh, it's a very isolated sport. When, when, uh, when isolation comes in, you've got you gotta, you gotta, you gotta to be ready for that. I always find it really interesting when people say like, oh, you guys are so lucky you get to travel and this and that, which I understand like tennis is a very privileged life, but also yeah. like when we travel, it's like we see the hotel and we're back. That's it. You know? So <laughs> it's like, so yeah, exactly. Just suitcase, 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 this and this. And at the end of the day, I reckon if you have always someone with you, if you if you if you're in love, if you if you if you can enjoy it, then it's fine. If you're stuck on your own with a Nintendo Switch <laughs> and a coach that really doesn't care about you, you know, you know what I mean? And yeah, then, that's right. Uh, well, they're just doing it for the money, or it does care about you a bit, but it's all like here and there. He's paid and stuff. And then you got to go through the steps. You got to go through the this. Then it becomes a little bit different. If you just find yourself a good team, and if you can be happy, whether however you want to do that, if you figure out what happiness and what drives you, then you have the best chance of doing well in tennis. 
Yeah, I think that's such good advice. And I feel like that goes beyond tennis too. So 2020 has been a very strange and unpredictable year. I saw you played five tournaments, starting with Aussie Open and ending with Monterey in March. It seems like you stopped right before the pandemic really picked up steam, I guess for the rest of the world as well. Was it intentional for you to not play any more tournaments to avoid the pandemic or did you just... Okay. Yes or no, I, uh, like I, I saw like I s- saw the flight starting to close one week after being in Miami, which I think I had a bit of corona. I wasn't sure that period. I thought I had a little bit of a, I was a bit viral and a bit sick, so I was like, maybe I do have it. And then all of a sudden, I got better after 10 days or so, and I was like, I've got to get out of here because the whole US is closing. <laughs> <laughs> so I left and I did the right thing, and then I've been here since the last eight months, and it's been the best eight months of my life, uh, I think, for sure. That's awesome. So watching you play, I think, you know, like I said about your job shot earlier, I was always kind of amazed at your court sense and your ability to read your opponents really well. And I think, you know, I'm not alone in thinking you have a lot of potential to do great things again. You're 28 now, which isn't super old for tennis these days. I mean, Federer is what, 39, I think. Do you think you have another good decade left in you? Yeah, well, I do. I do believe. Like, I've been on tour for a while and stuff. Cause I was 16. I was winning matches in Australian Open. I was, good, you know. So, my success came at a very young age. So, pressure came at a young age. Travel came at a young age for me, especially from Australia. Um, I don't think I can play till at least 38. That you know, a few other people like Lopez. He's 38 or 39. Still top 50. I think Badasco is 37, 38. Karlovic is 41. Federer is 39. And I think a couple other guys, 36, 37, 38, that are still top 100. So that's in another nine, 10 years from now. Do I ask myself the question, will I be play, still playing them? Probably not. Um, probably maximum I'll go to is probably 34, 35. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Definitely not 10 years. Maybe. <laughs> I just got my spirit together. Maybe to survive another five. Maybe <laughs> five, six, seven. That's maximum for me. 35. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like even you saying 35 like doesn't even sound old which is crazy like in any other sport I feel like that's really pushing it but you know Federer and Djokovic and these guys Nadal I mean they're really setting the standard these days it's crazy I, I think yeah absolutely people want to retire later now people are retiring back 31 32 33 and they thought that was old now people are realizing old's at 36 37 38 39 at sport I mean, I guess the money is a good motivation too. <laughs> it keeps going yeah, up I mean, every year. <laughs> why a player is going to retire if they're 35 years old, top 50, yeah. or 36 years old, at top 30, or 37 and top 80? They're still in Grand Slams. They're still playing. They're still, you know, they're not, yeah. they're not silly. All players like Lopez at 39, top 50. So, of course, he's still playing. He'll yeah. play another one, two years if his ranking's in the top 100. Yeah. So, last question before we go. Where do you intend to start 2021 and what are your goals for the new year? If we can even go there with how unpredictable the new year is going to be. Well, my goal is to, to get back into the top 100 next year. I mean, I'd like to say top 50, but maybe that's tough because I think my ranking is at 226, which I don't know how I didn't play for nine months. I think they froze it. The good thing is like they're looking at playing qualies now, maybe in another country. So, um, We'll see in the next couple of weeks what happens with that. Um, but I'd like to finish in the top. He's pushing it, but if I can finish in the top 100 by the next uh, eight months and then have a good base for the next three, four, five years after that, that's going to be good. So that's my sort of goal for 221. Hopefully, there is no more COVID and restrictions around the world. I think it's easing up now. I think it's getting better, but let's let's see. Hopefully the vaccine helps too, because I feel like once that kind of clears, everyone's going to feel a little bit better about being out there. So, Of course, of course, absolutely. Bernard, thank you so much for your time today. It was such a treat to catch up with you. <laughs> no problem, no problem. I hope you managed to get to those courts in the brain. <laughs> Hopefully things look up for me here. Sideliners, thank you so much for joining me for another episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you next week. Bye.